uh, afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Marion Fouquet. I'm the director of Social Science Matrix at UC Berkeley. And today we are more than delighted to welcome uh, all of you for this first distinguished lecture of the 2019-2020 academic year. The lecture was originally planned for last spring, and of course we all wish uh, it had been in person, but that wasn't to be, and Katharina was very gracious to accept to switch to Zoom. Uh, Matrix was conceived in 2013 as an incubator of early stage innovative and interdisciplinary social scientific research at UC Berkeley. In that function, we provide uh, support and leading infrastructure uh, to small research teams of scholars who want to try out and debate ideas across disciplinary boundaries. Over the years, Matrix has supported this kind of cross fertilization on a dazzling range of topics. We also host, convene, and sponsor or co sponsor many events. These include discussions of recent books by Berkeley faculty and topical panels and emergent issues, the now well established Matrix on Point series. As a taste of what we do, Matrix just held an on-point event today, earlier today, uh, just a couple of hours ago, on homelessness in the Bay Area. In October, we will host events uh, on the struggle for Hong Kong, the pandemic election in the US, as well as author meets critics panels. And you can see the rest of the events for the semester uh, on, your, uh, on your screen. More rarely, we host a distinguished lecture for a very distinguished guest. We are thrilled to have partnered uh, with the New Political Economy Group to invite Katharina Pistor, Professor of Law at Columbia University, to speak on her recent book, The Code of Capital. If you have not read it, do so right away. It is one of those rare books that combines rich, dense substance with lucid prose offers a forceful argument without skipping on indispensable detail and reminds us of our political agency as we imagine the possible path forward. So thank you, for Kat uh, Katharina, for this luminous work and for the gift of your presence today, our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. Um, I am really delighted uh, to welcome uh, Professor Katharina Pistor virtually today. She is the Edwin Parker Professor of Comparative Law at Columbia, where she also serves as the Director of the Center on Global Legal Transformation. She's a research associate with the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. She served as the principal investigator for the Global Finance and Law Initiative. Um, between 2011 and 2014, she was a member of the Board of Directors of the European Corporate Governance Institute and in 2015, she was elected a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences. She is a very prolific and accomplished scholar. Her scholarship lies at the intersection between law and economics, focusing particularly on govern, poor corporate governance, property rights, money, and finance, and comparative legal institutions. Her most recent book, it's called The Code of Capital, How the Law Creates Wealth and Inequality. She'll be talking about that today. Um, this is really a remarkable book, as Marianne has already uh, suggested. It was named one of the best books of 2019 by the Financial Times and Business Insider. Without any further ado, I introduce to you Professor Pistor. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for this very, very kind um, introduction. Let me just share my screen, because then I can walk you better through my, let me put this here and open this up and go to the very beginning of the screen. Here we go. Okay, well, so this is just the introduction and let me just sort of switch right away to, to the cover of my book. Some of you might have seen this already. The book came out uh, at Princeton University Press in 2019, but the paperback is forthcoming. And there's also, of course, a Kindle and an audio um, for those of you who are English native speakers and there are a couple of translations coming out. So um, bear with us. Um, 
let me just sort of give you the core ideas of the book and um, some applications. So you have some material to which I apply the framework and we can hopefully discuss even more applications in the Q&A, but I wanted to limit it to a, just a couple of them. So one of the core questions that the book addresses again is the question of what is capital? There are a lot of different definitions of what is capital out there. They're very functional or accounting definitions, they're legal definitions. What I'm basically arguing in the book is that capital is a wealth generating asset. And what we have to understand is the legal DNA, if you want to call it that. So the code of capital, we have to understand what kind of features create assets that are really wealth generating. And so just to give a simple example to which I will return um, shortly, if you take land, it's just a piece of dirt. If you want to monetize land, you have to graft certain legal protections um, for the holder of land rights onto that land. That's just not natural. It's a social decision. And I think one of the critical questions is who makes these decisions on behalf of whom and who has access to or control over the decision makers. Um, let me just take away the punchline. Lawyers are really important here, including private transactional lawyers who work mostly in private offices behind closed doors. So what are the characteristics of capital within my framework? I'm basically saying capital needs three out of four, at least, of these um, attributes that I have listed here on this slide. The first one is priority. Law ranks rights to assets. Uh, some have stronger rights and others have weaker rights. That allows us in um, times of dispute to decide who actually has the stronger right and therefore will win a lawsuit or will have the right to take an asset. So priority is key. Ranking rights is key. Another very often under discussed and underappreciated but really important attribute of capital is durability. The ability to extend rights that we bestow on asset holders over time and to protect these rights from too many other competing claimants. The third attribute is universality, which means that these rights, the priority rights, the durability rights, are protected not only between two people who entered into a transaction with one another, who have a relation where they negotiated these rights, but they're actually enforced against the world. The state comes in here because it will enforce these titles, not only against the party where, who were really parties to the transaction, but against anybody, erga omnes, as the lawyers will call, will call it. And then last but not least, um, convertibility is actually an attribute that is critical, particularly for financial assets. And it's the kind of attribute that actually gives durability to financial interests. What does this mean? If you hold financial assets, shares, bonds, asset-backed securities, other financial assets, the problem with these assets is that they might lose value and they might lose value rapidly, especially in times of crisis. At that moment, you want to convert these assets into an asset that holds at least its nominal value, even if not always its real value. And the only asset that can really do this is cash cash in particular by a monetarily sovereign state. So convertibility means that you have directly or indirectly some put option to convert your private assets, your share, shares, your bonds, your uh, debt instruments into, in, into cash. So three out of those four, and then you have something that I would call uh, capital. Now, how do we bestow these attributes, priority, durability, universality, convertibility on assets. We use actually only for the most part, a handful of institutions that we are very familiar with in the law that are quite old and that are relatively flexible and malleable in the hands of lawyers. So property law, property rights are critical because they rank rights. Collateral are types of property law. They don't give you full title, but they, they give you a stronger right than if you had only a contractual claim. Trust and corporate law do a lot of the work when, we, when we're thinking about durability because they create a veal, a legal veal around assets that protect a pool of assets against other claimants who might otherwise have an interest in these assets. Um, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, bankruptcy law also creates priority rights, right? So who can get the assets of a debtor? at the time when the data has defaulted is something that the bankruptcy um, law stipulates and typically it mimics 
what private parties have transacted for outside bankruptcy, but it also respects property rights. So if you're the owner of an asset that, did, that the debtor holds, you can take that asset out and the other creditors have to yield. If you have a secured interest or collateral in the asset, you can enforce against the assets before anybody else may. And if you have none of the above, you are one of the many unsecured creditors who will likely get a very steep haircut get less than you had expected when you contracted. And then last but not least, contract law can mimic some of the features of property law and collateral, not all of them, but info with information technology nowadays, actually we can contract for lots of things. And if you think about how many things you agree to every day when you go on the internet and you click agree, but in order to op open a new web page and enter a, a new service, you will get a sense of how powerful contract law has become. It creates universal binding um, relationships between a big tech company and its, its um, thousands, millions, if not billions of customers. Okay, so wh why do we need law for that? Um, what, what, what is the importance of law? Because that's my central argument, how the law creates wealth and inequality is the subtitle of my book. Uh, the key here is that um, the law is a representation of the centralized means of coercion. That's a very Weberian definition of what the state does, but it's really important to realize that the centralized state power is institutionalized as, as law. But law has different dimensions. Very often we think as lay people of law as a relationship between the citizen by, uh, and the state by which the state governs its citizens. And then if we know a little bit more, we might also think about civil and political rights or human rights more general and realize that actually citizens can also use the law, which is a creature of the state, against the state itself in order to protect their own individual and political, civil and political rights. And then there's this third dimension, which is really what my book is all about, is that citizens can harness the centralized means of coercion of the state for their own means when they want to organize their relationship with other citizens. It is this horizontal relationship between citizens or actors, they don't have to be citizens, individuals who want to harness the law, or avail themselves of the coercive powers of the state to organize their, their private rights. That's really what, what this book is all about. And so what I'm basically saying is when you go back in history and you go back to the 16th, 17th century when capitalism started to evolve, we can actually see that the same legal modules, this handful plus one, six legal modules, there can be others. I'm not, I don't want to say these are exclusive, but these are the core modules that have been used time and again to code capital. It all started with land. So we can see a lot of um, capital creation or a lot of also um, skill development for how to code capital when we look at land relationships um, in England, on the continent, in settlers colonies. I'll come back to that in a second. But then after that, it proliferated and, and, and actually captured other types of assets as well. Once lawyers and their clients had understood the mechanism, they realized that the same techniques, the same legal coding techniques could be applied to different types of assets. The story I'm telling is not a sequential story, so it's not, there's not a certain logic, first land, then firms, then debt, then know-how. It occurred in parallel. There's some periods in time where you could say, actually, this is really the period when the big corporations became um, important um, um, legal institutions, and a lot of work went into coding them. The 19th century with the free incorporation statutes come to mind, or intellectual property. Um, you can trace it back to the 15th century, but sort of the, the bulk of intellectual property development is probably at the end of the 20th century. Debt has been re relevant throughout. So I'm not saying there's a particular sequence here. What I'm showing in the book through different stories and, and actual cases is how capital has been coded in law. Okay, so I want to say a few words about two assets that I discuss in the book. One is land and the other is debt. I will skip firms and I will skip intellectual property rights and know-how, but I'd be more than welcome, um, happy to come back to that in the Q&A. So, for land, as I mentioned before, it's really the asset with which it all started. I have a quote by the late legal historian Bernard Rudden in the book, who basically said, you know, the core institutions for property were developed during feudalism. 
But the same institution have migrated to what he called funds in an article he wrote in 1994, financial claims that can be transferred globally with a click of a mouse or a key on the keyboard of a, of a computer. But he basically says what has been under investigated is that the structures are the same. And I basically use his quote and show that he was right. Um, so when you think about the enclosure of land, it was really about creating priority rights for landlords over commoners. There was a physical struggle in the fields as landlords started to close in property by building hedges or building fences or not opening the doors to the commoners at the time when they usually claimed rights to use the land for themselves. And then the commoners went in and they would break the hedges and they would tear down the fences and they would plow over the land that had been um, grown over um, by the landlords to have cash crops for the cities or where the sheep now would graze. But ultimately, the issue was not decided on the grounds in the field with violence. Ultimately, the issue was decided in the courts. And it took about 150 years throughout the 16th into the 17th century and lots of um, litigation on a case by case basis, whereby courts recognized the rights of landlords, mostly granting them seniority. They were there first. They told stories about since antiquity or since centuries, their families had been there and had only voluntarily shared the net land with the commoners, but ultimately they had the title and they got the title. When you then move to the settlers colonies to North America, Australia, um, New Zealand, um, also parts of Africa, you find um, English settlers now um, you know, setting foot into the, in, in these territories and making similar claims that the land is theirs because the people who had come before them actually did not have property rights. They couldn't really say seniority, but the argument they now use was mostly to say, it's, we improved the land. So our sovereign, the crown, discovered the land, we came settled and we improved the land and only when we improve the land do we have um, um, a claim to real title. John Locke, of course, famously um, formulated this doctrine, which is very often understood as a sort of a, a, a liberty right, sort of you, you, you put your labor into an object and so you should acquire prior, um, property rights if you do. But he was also an official of the British um, uh, colonizers in North America when he wrote the Stockton, so we, so we should, keep, should keep this in mind. So what is interesting though is that pro property rights alone don't do the trick for capital because you can lose your property rights. Once you have full title, you can monetize your property rights as um, Hernando de Soto and others have argued, you should give the poor property rights and then they can take out loans, build an, a, a business and sort of um, thereby uh, get out of poverty um, through economic transactions. In fact, when you do that, you can of course lose your assets because if you mortgage or collateralize them for creditors, they might take them away in times of downturns, including downturns over which you have no control. And we're just living through such an episode right now with the COVID pandemic where creditor and debt relations become rather um, contentious and, and socially problematic. So what the landlords in England did once they realized that they might lose their property rights again, they use another legal institution the trust or something close to the trust, which is basically a legal fiction whereby you can transfer some of your property rights to a different type of entity, the trust, which is managed by a trustee, not on your behalf, but on behalf of a beneficiary. And sometimes you could even figure as a beneficiary, but legally speaking, we have three people involved here. And the beauty of that is basically to say that when your creditors come and want to put their hands on your assets, you can say they are not mine. I transferred them, transferred them to my trustee. They're held in trust and the trustee manages them. If then the personal creditors of the trustee come and say, we want to enforce against these assets because you owe us something, the trustee can say, I don't really own these assets. I only have formal title, but the economic interest are with the beneficiary. And if the creditors of the beneficiaries come and say, we want to enforce against these assets because you owe us something, the beneficiary can say, not yet. I haven't really received these assets yet. Now, legal devices have been developed over time that give um, the creditors of the beneficiary some rights. But what I just wanted to show here is that Legal devices were created that protected landowners um, against uh, enforcement rights of creditors. 
Now, the interesting thing is that in England, these legal protections were respected by the courts and the legislature was unable to do much against that until 1881, after a major depression in agriculture. Contrast this with colonial North America, the pre-United States territories, where the English parliament adopted the Debt Recovery Act in 1732 and said, we will treat land and slaves, by the way, like chattel, which means we can enforce against the land even if you try to entail it or if you try to create these kind of trust structures. And that basically had a major impact on the distribution of wealth. So let me just show you two uh, graphs very quickly by Piketty. It's from Piketty's 2014 book about capital in the 21st century, where he has a chapter on the metamorphosis of capital. This black block down here is what I'm interested in. Um, and he shows that actually the, you know, before 1900, roughly, land, rural land was one of the most important sources of wealth. And then it rapidly declined. You can see this right here. And it declined after 1881. That's when we changed land law in England and basically said land can be put on the auction block just like any other asset as well. It basically took away durability from land relationships and made uh, uh, land a much more ordinary asset. Contrast this with the United States, where I said in 1732, the English Parliament already had taken away that ability and you see a much flatter evol evolution of land as a source of asset. What you do see in over time in both countries is the use of similar legal devices just for different types of assets. Okay, so let me say a, a few words about minting debt um, so I can also come to some of the bigger issues that you might be interested in. So, Debt, of course, is a contractual relationship. I owe you something. I will pay you in six months, principal plus interest. Now, whether or not we can transfer this bilateral obligation is something that had to evolve over time. When you go back to the 12th century, it was actually not possible in most jurisdictions to freely transfer even the rights of the creditor, much less the debtor in these type of relations. Nowadays, we treat debt as an asset, as if it was a thing, and we can collateralize claims and we create repo transactions, repurchase transactions, which talk about who holds the title to a particular asset, the asset being actually, when you think about it, only in contractual claim. Now, since the 1970s in this country, we have seen the rise of asset-backed securities, um, of course, most famously, fa famously with the mortgage-backed securities, and I have a little scheme here to show you how you can transform with the legal techniques, with legal coding techniques, a loan relationship between a homeowner and a bank into an asset or multiple assets that are being traded globally and that can be repackaged into all kinds of different uh, fancy instruments. So the first on, the, on, on your left hand side, you have basically here the little homeowners that take out loans. Uh, New Century is the originator. They take out or, or originate thousands of loans. They package them together. They hand them over, transfer them for money, of course, to city. city sets up a trust, a legal veal, the same kind of trust I mentioned before when I talked about landowners in Britain entailing their land, similar idea of the legal um, structure. And uh, what, what they basically do is this trust makes sure that city itself doesn't have responsibility for the trust and conversely that the investors in the trust don't have to think about where the city might go bankrupt or have a default or other credit event. So then you throw these assets into the trust and you issue interest to the beneficiaries who are now financial investors. I give you a sense of how global this has become by looking at a particular case, case study here and you have Fannie Mae, a government sponsored entity, but you also have China Investment Corporation, a sovereign wealth fund, a German state bank, a French private entity and many, many other investors investing into these assets. And then one problem, of course, with these, uh, with these interests in these trusts were that not all of them were easily placed with investors um, because they were typically tranched, which is creating priority rights now through contractual means by saying, well, some people who buy the senior interest, they're better protected than those who buy only the junior interest. And typically the mezzanine tranches here were not easily to place. For them, we create another legal entity. We just find some sponsor who sets up a limited liability company in the Cayman Islands that buys the mezzanine tranches, not only in this 
RMBS Trust, but in many others, packages them, to them together and sells them to note holders again. And then we tranche these interests again and so forth. So you can, with the law, you basically have now created asset-backed securities and you have created collateralized debt obligations. And then we can square and cube these collateral debt obligations if we want to create yet another entity that buys all the assets that we haven't sold before. It's a legal technique, it's quite um, versatile and is, is being used nowadays more for collateralized loan obligations rather than um, CDOs which have um, fallen into uh, disrespect after the global crisis. Now here is, um, of course, this is a picture from The Matrix, since um, um, I'm talking to an institute that's called The Matrix, I thought I'd just bring this up as well. When I was writing the book, I was thinking about this movie a lot, but I was thinking about the legal code as being this world in which we have coded our social and legal relations. But we've, of course, also seen in recent years the rise of the digital code, and one of the questions I ask myself in the, towards the end of the book is whether the legal code might be replaced at some point or is already being replaced by the digital code. Um, the beauty of the digital code is it's highly scalable. We don't even have to rely on centralized state power at the territorial or nation state level, but we can create digital relations um, across national boundaries. Um, we, of course, use them for smart contracts. We have learned how to create digital autonomous organizations. There have been some failure, but that's part of the story. There are digital currencies, there are cryptocurrencies, etc. So in the book, which I basically completed roughly two years ago, um, I come out with the question, is this a new co code? Will it replace the legal code? That the relationship, at least so far, is more one of complementarity and, and perhaps where the legal code will encode the digital code rather than the other way around. But I think that question is still open and something that we might want to discuss later on. Let me just come to uh, uh, two or three more big issues I just wanted to, big picture issues I wanted to flag. One is, what do we make of global relations? The second is, who are the masters of the code? And this, the third is, what about we the people? So let me just take them up in, in order. I told you that the core modules of the Code of Capital are institutions of private law. These are institutions of domestic law. So if capital is coded in domestic law, you should now ask me, why is it that we have a global capital system? How can such a system be sustained? And my answer to this puzzle is that in theory, it would be sufficient to have a single legal system, sustain capital as long as all other states respect, recognize and enforce the legal modules, the legal rights um, that have been created under that legal system. In fact, we don't have one legal system that dominates global capitalist relations, but two, only two. I should emphasize the laws of England and the laws of, of, of the United States, specifically New York state law when it comes to financial law, property rights, collateral trust law, etc. And for corporate law, you can um, throw in the law of the state of Delaware for good measure. It works because other states have changed their conflict of law rules, which is what we call these body of laws. It says, will a state recognize and, for, and enforce the rules of a different state. And we have given private parties a lot of autonomy, a lot of rights to pick and choose the law by which they wish to be governed. Um, and that basically is um, how globalization works. It's not the harmonization of standardization at the global level so much as it is the private stitching together of different legal systems and choosing those that best work for the clients of well-paid lawyers. Which brings me to the question, you know, who's done it? Who are the masters of the code? We all know, of course, that so far the two leading financial centers are still um, New York and uh, London. There are competitors out there. There's, there's Hong Kong, currently politically in trouble. You will learn more about this, I guess, on the 1st of October, if I saw the calendar correctly. Um, but there, are, there is Shenzhen, Shenzhen, there's, of course, Singapore. There are other contenders out there. But so far, it's London and New York. What is less often recognized is that there's not only London and New York in terms of a financial center, but they're also the hubs for the largest global law firms. These are law firms that have um, offices in more than one jurisdiction. And I just gave you the list of the top 20, but if you bring it down to the top um, 100, it doesn't look much different. Most of them are Anglo-Saxon firms. So globalization is really the globalization of Anglo-Saxon legal practice uh, with a very strong American bent to that. Um, and then, of course, the question comes up, well, you know, what do we make of 
our democratic um, idea of democratic self-governance. If we have a system whereby private entities can relatively freely pick and choose the rules by which they want to govern their private relations and yet rely on the enforcement of these laws by the courts of different jurisdictions because it's only then that it works. Right? It can't be illegal. It can't be a breach of legal rules. It must be legal. And the claim of enforceability is core when you want to sell assets in anonymous markets where the other side at the other end of the globe has no idea who the issuer was and what the other intermediaries were really up to. What you have to do is you have to imbue them with the idea of enforceability and that has to be credible. So that system we have built over decades. Um, I'm just glancing at the q and I think something about Adam Smith is coming up, what I'm basically saying. Adam Smith, of course, talked about the invisible hand. He said, you know, people will always come back to their home country and will basically bring whatever transactions and whatever goods they bought elsewhere overseas back to their home country. Why? Because they know the local laws and the local institutions, and that's what they rely on. What we have in fact created is a system where people can rely on the institutions of different countries and can still rely on them. So the pullback to the home country is much, much weaker. In fact, we have something that I call roving um, capital or roving capitalist. Uh, we have created a system so that you can, those with um, wealth and wealth interest can get their right coding from wherever they want to find it, leaving behind people who want to self-govern through democratic means, um, who basically have to face um, agents who have picked different laws and yet can enforce them in the territory of these people. So the question, of course, is then what do we make out of this tension between the private autonomy of um, well-resourced clients and their lawyers to code capital and the rest of us who are trying to um, create rules for a collective, um, the, 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 the people who, who, who um, populate a particular territory. So I'm basically saying the coding of capital is oblivious to democracy. Um, in, in that respect, also anti-democratic. It doesn't care where the law comes from that best suits um, clients. In fact, some people endorse the notion that it's an expression of freedom to be able to vote with your feet and pick the laws from different regimes if they work better for us. But of course, this means also that um, that the most well-resourced um, agents can, can, can go and find law elsewhere and can invoke nonetheless state power to enforce it. So at the end of the book, I'm um, suggesting a couple of um, interventions that are that I think or at least thought that could be used to at least roll back the system a little bit. So I'm a little bit skeptical just to put my chips on the table here. I'm a bit skeptical about revolution and, and wholesale transformations of systems. My reading of history and comparative law is that very often what you see after a, 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 a more radical shift is the reconstitution of the very old. So Piketty himself suggests in his most recent book that he was surprised how, how quickly um, the levels of inequality that France had prior to the revolution um, came back um, very quickly afterwards. And, and basically what I'm saying is we have to get at the system. It's not enough to chop up chop off a head of a, of a ruler. What you really have to do is get at the system. The system, of course, is resistant. So you have to um, use an approach which I want to call strategic incrementalism. Um, and I have a, a list, a laundry list here. I think it's probably, it probably will take too long to go through that, but I just want to um, pick, uh, depict a little bit the, the general approach. It's basically taking a page out of the script that capital and lawyers and capital holders have used over centuries to say, okay, how did you do this? And what did you need to accomplish this? And how much do we have to take back to, so that we can make sure that we can cherish our democratic um, uh, values and, and, and get the upper hand in, in governance again? So let me just stop here and maybe get some um, questions so I, I, I know where you're coming from and can be more responsive to what your interests might be. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, this book, as you can see, covers an incredible amount of territory, geographical territory, uh, time, and also lots of issues. And it's amazing that you summarize so much of it in a short period of time. So we do have some questions. I'm going to uh, pick one here to get us kicked off. Thank you for your fascinating book. My question is about incorporation, the entities and relations it brings about, and what power the public should have with respect to corporate action and governance. 
concession theorists think that because corporations are constituted by state action, the public should have presumptive and full freedom to determine what corporations should and shouldn't be allowed to do. Others disagree, arguing that because trust, contracts, and markets in general also depend on law, there is nothing normatively distinct about corporations, and the public should not have more authority than they have regarding people's contract and property entitlements, whatever we take these to be. What's your position on this issue? So my position is that, you know, both property rights and corporations owe their existence to state power. So there's no real difference. But what uh, distinguishes the corporation from a simple business organization, such as a partnership, is a particular feature that you cannot reconstruct in contract law. And that is the legal personality or what some of my colleagues call, call um, asset petitioning or asset shielding. So the notion that we create a legal entity that owns its own assets and can contract in its own name, sue and be sued in its own name, thereby also can tell the shareholders, no, you can't take your money out again. You can sell your share, but you can't have the assets back. And your personal creditors cannot come and take the assets of the firm either. That's a legal construct. And so I think because this is basically owed to the law, the law can also set the conditions under which you can avail yourself of this new power to create a legal entity. What we've seen over the last 200 years is basically a move first towards free incorporation. Anybody can set up a corporation that meets certain legal obligations. But then the conditions for setting up these corporations have been softened and softened and softened and softened so that we have almost the appearance of a contractual uh, corporation when you look at the theory about Delaware law and how it's being used. And yet the power of the corporation are, devised, are de derived really from our collective. And I think, and I do have a chapter in the book that deals with the corporation is that the corporate form has been increasingly abused just as an asset shielding device, not so much as a device to diversify risk and raise new funds, but it has really been flipped into, into a capital minting um, operation. And I think we have to curtail that a little bit. I'm not saying just take it all back. I'm not saying necessarily that the legislature should um, you know, approve every corporation as it, they did in the early 19th century, but I think we have to find a new middle ground. Uh, that's great. We have two questions on China. In the interest of time, I'm gonna merge them and call this the final question. Um, so I'll ask both of them and then you can kind of put your answer into one. First version of the question is, Thank you for your fascinating and succinct book. I'm curious if you're aware of the Chinese practice of infrastructure expansion in developing, namely African countries, which is then repossessed upon non-payment. Do you believe that Sino-global relations will continue to leverage Anglo-American legal ideas, or do you predict accelerated legal norm formation by Chinese scholars? Second version of sort of the same question. Do you anticipate that a new coding of capital will arise out of China and historic Chinese law driven by China as the new global leading power? So I do think that there are a lot of very imaginative and powerful lawyers in China emerging. Um, but China still is, it's, a, it's an interesting setting because you have a much larger level of state um, supervision, monitoring and intervention, uh, certainly domestically. But I think externally, when we think about Africa, what we're seeing is something that is not unfamiliar to how the West has dealt with colonies and uh, developing countries and emerging markets as using debt as a mechanism of de creating dependence and using property rights and the claim to property rights and, and um, supposedly neutral norms to, to repossess and, and gain control. So I, I don't think this is an entirely new game. It's just played it out in a slightly different uh, time in history and, and by the Chinese, but uses very similar mechanisms. So I would say this is the, you know, Although China has um, uh, conducted its economic reforms very distinctively and very different from many other Western reforms, it is a really good student in creating legal and institutional structures of dependencies. And, and so I think it's probably a mixture of Chinese ideas and Western legal coding techniques. Fantastic. Thank you. On that note, um, I'm going to call it a day. I'd like to thank the audience for some great questions. My apologies to those we did not get to. Um, thank you, Katerina, for a, for a fascinating session. Um, you have our thanks as well as thunderous applause, which you can't hear, uh, but, but it's there nonetheless. Um, so thanks so much. Thank you, Stephen, for moderating. Really appreciate it. Thanks for everyone. <laughs>